All right. I want to talk to you today about the Bible doctrine of off-gridology. <laughs> I thought I was going to be the one that coined the term off-gridology, but uh, I saw some other guy, I think college professor or something, made the term before me, off-gridology. So, um, and of course I'm saying this in jest. It's not a Bible doctrine in terms of it's saying in the scriptures that you have to be off-grid or you're going to hell or something. Uh, no, but just bear with me with this study. Um, kind of a unique little sermon here, but uh, just want to make a point. Um, how many people in the, how many writers in the scriptures had on-grid electricity and conveniences? Zero. And you say, well, of course. I mean, this is dumb. Bear with me. I'm trying to make a point here. Okay. Um, so then if you really wanted to live in an off-grid, non-electric type of a system, wouldn't you want to find an ancient source that told how to live? How did people live in the past? See, uh, one of the problems with modern off-grid living is you get these people that say we're off-grid and all that they're doing is they're just taking their on-grid city conveniences and they're moving them off-grid and then getting, you know, spending insane amounts of money to make them work without being connected to the power grid. Well, I don't really think that that's really, you know, you're kind of cheating the whole off-grid thing. Um, off-grid living, if you get right down to it, should be about a simple life, a life of where you're giving up certain conveniences to be out in a beautiful place like this. And this is on my off-grid property, by the way, I would like to add. Um, I'm in northern Maine, and we live off-grid. Um, we lived here for a few years now. I've owned this property since 2017, and I have lived in off-grid situations um, and been, you know, and stayed in off-grid situations in a lot of different states uh, around the country here in America and also down in Honduras and Costa Rica. Went on mission trips many years ago. So, uh, and I've been in Alaska, off-grid, in Montana, um, different places like that. And so I've seen a lot of different things about off-grid living. Um, I experienced a lot of non-electric stuff going to my uncle's cabin as a boy, um, being raised in Pennsylvania. We go up to his cabin and uh, so off-grid, quote unquote, off-grid non-electric living is not new to me. It's been something I've experienced all throughout my life. Um, and I've studied it quite extensively. Uh, so it's a very, it's not something I'm ignorant of, say it that way. But uh, the one thing I've learned is if you really want to be to succeed in, in not having the conveniences of the on-grid world, then it's not really a matter of, like I said, finding ways to make on-grid things work off-grid. It's more, what did ancient people do? Ancestral living, in other words. Um, and I'll show you a verse here real quickly about that, a very famous verse which a lot of people will turn to in the Bible. Um, and it's, you know, I'm not saying, again, that you have to live the way people did a thousand years ago or something like that. But you learn from the past and you say, you know what, I can, I can learn some, some great things from, the, from my ancestors. How did my grandparents do it? I mean, there are some of us out there, I'm 46, going to be 46 years old this year. Um, my grandparents, when they were first born in the early 1900s, they didn't have electricity. So they lived without electricity. Uh, and I talked to them and I knew them for a long time. Um, they're all dead and gone now, but uh, I think the last one died just a few years ago. My grandmother, she was over 100 years old. And, uh, but you know, um, there's a lot of people that have lived without electricity. There's people that live without electricity to this very day. And, you know, they've always lived that way. So that's what you study when you want to get into the off-grid thing. Don't say, how can I fit 60,000 watts of solar on my property so I can have a dishwasher and, a, and all the other stuff of, you know, a microwave oven and a 75-inch flat screen TV. You're missing the point. It's about simplifying your life. If you can define what off-grid is really about, off-grid living should be about being simple, simple and sustainable, all right? And you can learn those lessons from the scriptures. Let me show you a verse of scripture here. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. 
Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, Here, we will not walk therein, like a lot of people do. We'll be talking about that in this study. But you see, it says there, Ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. You know why I'm an off-gritter? Because I find rest out here. What do you hear? Can you hear a lot of vehicles and airplanes and sirens and horns beeping and what? No. You might be able to hear some noise in the background. My wife and my son are bringing firewood in to our tiny house right over here. Small, sustainable, old paths. What did people do in the past? Well, they built 5,000 square foot houses out in the middle of nowhere. No, they didn't. They built small, small little log cabins. And then they built their actual house after that. There's a lot of wisdom that can be gained from the old people, from the ancient people of the past. Off-gridders, the ones that make it, um, you don't really completely believe in evolution because you understand that people actually were very smart in the past. Modern man is actually very foolish. So you can't quite totally be into the evolutionary philosophy. Um, you have to realize, no, there was some of the old timers, the guys that came out here with cross-cut saws and axes and logged places like this. You can't see it right now, but over that way, there's uh, stone walls over in this way. Big stone fences where they, the early settlers that came here in the 1800s to this area, um, they came in here and they, what do they have? Trees. This is all forests of mountains all around this area. Just rocks everywhere. And they wanted to farm this land. And so they picked up all these rocks by hand and they made walls. They made stone fences. I have them all over the property here. Old ancient stone fences where separate the field and the pastures and, the, and the, put the livestock into that pasture over there. And we're going to grow potatoes and whatever else over in this field. And they did it without tractors. Hmm. Maybe you can learn a few things from those people. You know what I mean? Uh, what did they do when they got here? And there's no grocery store. Talked to an older man from uh, sort of over in Aroostook County, uh, the most northern part. We're in northern Penobscot here. Talked to a man from Aroostook County, and his ancestors were some of the first people that settled the area. And he said, they came here with a horse-drawn wagon, like a, not a covered wagon or anything per se, but uh, they came here and they had axes and cross-cut saws, and that was it. <laughs> a few window panes, glass panes for the windows that they would make when they got here and cut the trees down and whatever else. And they came up here and they survived. Roads weren't being plowed. There's no grocery store. Could you learn some things from those people? Yeah. You say, oh, I just can't imagine. It must have been a tough life. Well, in some ways, sure, it was a tough life. But you know what? It's a good life. It's a wholesome life. It's a wonderful life. You walk outside and, and you work hard. The Bible talks about the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. And you'll learn that one if you go off grid and truly off grid. <laughs> you go out and you cut your firewood. Do firewood for a couple days and see how you sleep. See how you eat. See how your body feels just so alive. You're out here and just breathe in this air. I go into a city, I feel like I'm suffocating. There's a lot more to off-grid living than just unplugging from the city conveniences and trying to plug it into solar generator out here. There's a lot more to it. And a big part of it is learning from the old ways, from the ancestral people and constantly learning and looking, and that's interesting. You know, how did people come up here and live without refrigeration? I mean, there's so many things. Well, we just can't do that anymore. Why not? Hmm. Let me show you a couple of things. Proverbs chapter 21 in the King James Bible. There's a problem uh, that I've seen the number one problem why very few men get to live off grid. And uh, I'm going to offend a lot of people with this, but uh, I'm a preacher. I'm used to it. That's what I do for a living. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 19. 
It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. <laughs> oh boy. What, who's one of the most well-known off-grid men? Uh, Dick Prenicky. One Man's Wilderness. Went up to Alaska and he built a log home up there. And a lot of men read that book and they dream of that. And they think, wow. But uh, boy, Dick Prenicky's wife, uh, she really, you know, she went along with it. She was right there helping. Uh, oh, no, he actually wasn't married. Hmm. Um, I don't know if he was ever married. I don't think he was from what I've learned about him. I think he was a single man for life, but uh, he didn't have a wife with him. And um, there's another man I saw the one time on, on YouTube, the video is a man named Jack English, and he lived out in the middle of nowhere and uh, five miles away from anything, you know, and I don't mean just five miles from town. I'm talking five miles from a road. And I remember watching that and uh, I think he made violin, the, the bow or whatever for violins and, um, and watching the video and, and he just liked to live out there by himself and his wife had died of cancer at some point in time and she said to him on her deathbed, she said, you go on out there and live there now. And she said, I know I kept you from going out there all these years and it was always your dream to go out there and live. And so you go out and you live there now. Another man that didn't have a wife out there and uh, there's another group of men, uh, men that uh, they have a cabin and they're married, they're family men, and their wife is contentious and she's a problem. And that man goes to his cabin a lot of times and he feels the peace and he walks out and he just says, oh boy, beautiful morning, nice cold, clear air, and he drinks a sip of his coffee and he looks around and he dreams in his mind and he says, I'd do anything to live out here. And if he ever brings it up to his wife, what? Live out there? Are you kidding me with an outhouse and a, and a this and a that and there's no electric and rah, 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 rah. And the guy puts up with her for a while and eventually she just is so contentious and then, okay, time for a divorce. And uh, he says, I want the cabin. And she says, I don't want that thing. Boy, you just go out there and live. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. And the man fulfills that. I know a bunch of them. Okay. I've heard that scenario many times of men that uh, their wife leaves them. She gets the house and the children a lot of times because the courts side with the women nowadays. And uh, the man gets the cabin. And the man's better off. Why? Because the Bible says so. Hmm. And I'll tell you right now, if you are a man that has been blessed with a wife that lives off grid, that wants to live off grid and doesn't need all the city conveniences and all the on grid conveniences and everything else, that uh, loves being out, outside, outdoors as much as you do, you are blessed. Who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies, the Bible says. Um, you're wealthy if you are a man that has a wife that likes to be off grid. You better thank God for her. Okay, because there's not many of those out there. Uh, a lot of women, they're very weak in those matters. Um, just stating a fact, and you know it. <laughs> I mean, there's most men that live off grid, they're living there by themselves. All right, uh, they don't have a wife. You'll see it occasionally. They might get a girl to come out there with them or your girl, girlfriend or whatever. But most of them, they don't have a wife out there. Hmm. Almost like the Bible knew some things. Uh, the word... You know, the writer of the Bible, I'll say, uh, knew a few things and put it down for people to understand and to read and learn from. Hmm. Isaiah chapter 32. We're not done with this subject. I'll show you what the Bible has to say about this. It's an old saying, you know, they say, what's the Bible? What does Bible stand for? Basic instructions before leaving earth, B-I-B-L-E. Well, if this is our owner's manual, so to speak, uh, then you can see what the Bible says about the issue of living off-grid and ancestral living and what keeps most men from doing that. But this is, gets really interesting here. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 9 through 20. Rise up, ye women that are at ease. On-grid women. 
Hear my voice, ye careless daughters, give ear unto my speech. God is speaking to these women in Israel and he's saying, you're at ease, you're careless. Sitting around, you know, on your lazy boy recliner because you don't have much work to do, physical labor and whatever, and oh, it's just too hard off grid. Well, you might not understand that it actually brings you joy. Instead of saying that you want to sit around and ease at home and you want all these conveniences and everything else, and then you have to have a gym membership to stay in shape, why don't you just move off grid and you get in shape by working hard? And you actually come out here and you enjoy it. You get to work hard outdoors with the gardening and the taking care of animals and helping the husband with firewood and helping build and helping to do all these different things. It's a beautiful life out here. Again, I'm not, I'm not making fun of women by this study, not at all. If, there, if you're a woman out there, I pray that this sermon convicts you so that you don't become one of these wicked women that gets contentious and just wants this and wants that. If you're a high maintenance city woman, God have mercy on you. You better repent of that. Um, because you're looking for peace and you're looking for joy and contentment in the things of this world and you'll never find it, ever. And a lot of you are willing to destroy your marriage and mess up your children for the rest of their lives because of those city conveniences. And if yet you'd come out to a place like this and you feel the adversity and things and the challenges of living off grid, the challenges of not having everything just a flip of the switch of the light and whatever else, and, and all of a sudden it'd start to draw all the family closer together. Instead of getting divorced, you'd actually be enjoying life if you have the right mentality when you come out here. If you want to come out and bring your city conveniences with you, then you're going to be miserable. But you come out and you enjoy a day like this. You know, I remember a John Denver song, you know, I think I'd rather be a cowboy. And it said about she got tired of picking daisies, cooking my meals for me. She used to be a big John Denver fan, you know, and uh, she can live the life, life she wants to. It's all right with me. She went back to the city and he stayed out. I think I'd rather be a cowboy. And there's a lot of men that relate very much to that because you know where the peace is found. You know, it's not in the materialistic stuff of the city. It's out here. You ever watch a deer walking along in the early morning? Walk out through the woods and you see a big moose standing out there watching the birds playing in the trees and you just stand there and watch them for a while. And you try to whistle and mimic their, their bird call and they'll fly over to the trees and they look at you. You watch a, name it. See, so, you know, eagle soaring. And you want me to find peace in the city? with things, go get a new iPhone, go to this theater here in opera and watch a bunch of people screaming their lungs out in the opera. No, thank you. <laughs> oh, you don't have much culture. Oh, well, if culture means being in the city, then you're right, I don't, and I don't want it. I wanna be out in the nature what God made. That's where peace comes. Verse 10, many days and years shall ye be troubled, ye careless women, for the vintage shall fail, the gathering shall not come. What's that talking about? Let's see it defined here in a minute. Tremble, ye women that are at ease. Be troubled, ye careless ones. Strip you and make you bare and gird sackcloth upon your loins. You should really be sorry for who you are, in other words. They shall lament for the teats, for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. That's the vintage that fails. You're not going to have wine. I mean, do you realize that the fragile supply chain of things here in America right now? You realize how, how much of your city conveniences are going to disappear in the future? I mean, China has access to our power grid. They're already doing testing and things like this uh, to, to test how to shut down parts of the power grid. But you rely on that. That's where you feel safe and you just can't imagine being out in the woods. <laughs> oh boy, you have some shocks coming. Verse 12. They shall lament, or excuse me, verse 13. Upon the land of my people shall come up thorns and briars, yea, upon all the houses of joy in the joyous city. The houses are going to be falling down. Look at Detroit, Michigan. Look at the houses. A lot of areas up here, the towns and things, the houses are falling down. Why? The economy is going away. Things are getting worse. You might want to get off grid. You might want to come out here and learn to work hard. Learn to rough it a little bit. You know, it's, it's, I have to just kick something else while I'm at it here. I find it rather interesting that the more liberated women become and the more tough they become in word, 
um, the more weak they become indeed. Why is that? Oh, we're liberated. We're just as good as men. Can you come out here and live? Are you kidding me? No, I couldn't make it out there. I can't go outside and go to the bathroom in an outhouse when it's 30 degrees below zero. I would die. I can't, I can't think of not having running water and, and actually having to carry jugs of water. And, 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 and. I thought you're liberated. I thought you're stronger than women in the past. And isn't it funny that women in the past that had long hair and wore long dresses and were beautiful and everything and very feminine, they could live at a place like this and do just fine. But the more women become like men, the more, uh, you know, strong they become, the weaker and more fragile they become. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Verse 14, because the palaces shall be forsaken. I love that. See a lot of these big Victorian mansions and things, and, and uh, they can't even fix them up anymore. You know, uh, inflation, the cost of lumber. You know, in just one year, the cost of, of building a house in America, I think, went up $25,000 because of the uh, inflation and everything else. People can't even fix up the palaces anymore. The palaces shall be forsaken. The multitude of the city shall be left. The forts and towers shall be for dens forever. A joy of wild asses, a pasture of flocks. I remember seeing this. Honestly, honest to God to tell you the real story here. I remember going down in West Virginia. I have relatives that moved down there. And there was a, a field and there was an old house in that field and it was run down the, the kids never came back to it they left and whatever else and uh this field the the farmer had a pasture there and uh, the cows actually would go into the house and were walking around inside the house going to the bathroom and whatever else and i you know, probably went in there when it was raining and things and just hung out in the people's house in the living room you know and a lot of the boards are broken and you could tell where they knocked stuff over and and, you know, busted kind of the door trim and whatever. What's going on there? The fortune towers shall be for dens forever, a joy of wild asses, a pasture of flocks. All the rich, wealthy places that were built here in America and, and uh, built back in times when they could afford the home heating oil and, and all the electric bill and everything because it's cheap back then. Those places are abandoned now. Again, just north of us here, about an hour, well, not even an hour drive away, uh, there's some big giant place, glass windows all the way around it, you know, 4,000 some square feet and, uh, you know, high ceilings, cathedral ceilings and big, beautiful, uh, artistic, contemporary, modern house and everything. Nobody even wants it. Too hard to heat. What's its future? Well, going through northern Maine winters, it's probably going to fall down eventually. And then there will be animals walking around in it. You might not want to think about those things and lust after those things if you're a woman. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. You'll learn to love the quiet out here if you ever live in this kind of a life. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation and in shore dwellings and in quiet resting places. You know, I don't hear very many vehicles out here when I go to sleep at night. It's a blessed thing. Um, and you're going to offer me what in the city again? Donald Trump says to me tomorrow, hey, I'd like to give you, I'm going to donate to your ministry. Wouldn't accept it, but it, I'm going to donate my, uh, my penthouse apartment in New York City with all that's pattern after King Louis the 14th or whatever. I'm going to give you that place. You can move in tomorrow. Keep it. I don't want it. I have peace out here. I own a house in town where I do the ministry stuff. Uh, I don't live there. I can't live there. I couldn't stand to be there right along the major road. I don't sleep good like that. I'd rather stay out here. I'd rather be out here where it's peaceful and quiet. You say, well, someday you'll build a big mansion there. No, I won't. Verse 19, When it shall hail coming down on the forest, and the city shall be low in a low place, 
Blessed are ye that sow beside all waters that send forth thither the feet of the ox and the ass. Yeah, out here taking care of livestock. We don't have any yet, but uh, it's a blessing. You get some farm woman and she's out there and she's taking care of the garden and going out and she's milking the cow in the morning and whatever else. It's a blessing. Ask them. You see some woman that's off grid, truly off grid and whatever else. Ask her. And not these women, you know, well, we have a YouTube off grid reality show, you know, and whatever else. And, and we're out here and we just, you know, and you get these harlots too on YouTube and things. And they, you know, take off their clothes to get good views and whatever else and, and whatnot disgusting it's very disturbing you know and, it, and then you get the bushcraft people and they kick this whole movement too and they're you know seven day survival challenge in the rocky mountains or in the desert or in the you know seven day survival challenge and then they go back to their on-grid dwelling it's kind of a okay i'm not against people making a campfire out in a place like this but you know it's going to take your your knife out and see if you can cut down a bunch of small trees and build a survival shelter so you can live alone for a week of your time or you could actually come out and take care of the property buy some land and get away from your little on-grid stuff i don't care i mean you don't want to listen to me well whatever that's that's between you and god ezekiel the book of ezekiel chapter 34 and, you know, I, I, I'm not going to lie to you and say that there's times I don't think about, you know, how it was when being on grid and whatever. And there's times I falter and kind of think, boy, it'd be nice to go back to the grid again. I sure miss this or I sure miss that. Sure, I have those times, but the uh, Lord always brings me back. What about this, Brian? What about that, Brian? Yesterday, literally at my office in town, um, right in the middle of uploading a video and power goes out. You know, right in the description to it and everything else, and boom, power goes out. Then you play the, when is the power coming back on game? You know, I can't call on the power company because our, our phone is a cable phone, you know, so it's not the, the regular landline of, you know, you can pick it up and call when there's no electricity. It's tied into the internet. And so you're sitting there <laughs> in the darkness. Okay, you know, turn on your flashlight, whatever, and... When's the power going to come back on? Is it going to come back on in five minutes, 10 minutes, a half hour, three hours, 24 hours? No idea. What'd I do? I'll just go back to the place where I control the power. Ezekiel 34, verse 25 through 28. Ezekiel 34, verse 25 through 28. And I will make with them a covenant of peace and will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. This is what Jesus Christ is going to do when he comes back. Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to make smart cities like you've never seen. I'm going to have, you know, all this high text. No, Jesus comes back and he says, I'm going to rule and reign here for a thousand years. You say, where are we going to live, Lord? The people that are left. Lord says, uh, out here. <laughs> Habitations in the wilderness. You're going to sleep in the woods. You know, right now, there's these trees that are all around me right here. This one right here. This is a uh, balsam fir tree right there. See that? Balsam fir. And you know something? There's been tests done that these things actually produce an essential oil that helps with uh, T blood cell production, I think it is. Um, actually helps boost your immune system. Just being out here and smelling this has sap in these trees in the, in the bark. There's little little nodules and you go over and you poke them with your knife or whatever else and, and sap oozes out, it's real sticky. It's antiseptic, really good for you. It's amazing, it smells great. It's sort of a citrus, you know, type of smell, it's wonderful. You come out here, it smells great. I love the smell of it. Working with this wood and things like that, it's, it's beautiful. And what does God think about that? Well, when he comes down here, hey, I want you to sleep out here. Why? For your health. This will boost your immune system more than anything. Just being out here in nature, eat the wild berries, 
eat as many wild foods as you can, you're doing yourself a favor by coming out to a place like this. And if you're some woman out there and you're saying, well, I just don't know if I could, uh, you'd be surprised. You really want to be empowered? Go back to the ancient ways, ancestral ways of your people. You can learn a lot. I've studied a lot of different cultures and things, you know, the, even African cultures and Oriental cultures and things, and there's some fascinating stuff. Wouldn't work for us here, but, you know, there's some fascinating things about the way people live off grid. On grid, well, everything just becomes the same. You all become dependent. Let's continue reading here. See where we're at here. Verse, what was it uh, 26, I guess. And I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing, the old hymn says. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beast of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. That's what's coming in the future. Now, that's not here today, but you can get a small glimpse of it when you go off grid. You can get a small glimpse of the peace that comes from being out here. None shall make them afraid, you know. Um, I'm not worried about some kind of a guy coming up to me right now and asking for my wallet. I'm not worried about riots and looting and protests and whatever else coming here. Not really worried about it, especially in the winter. Uh, people don't want to come here that much. They'll come here to go snowmobiling and whatever else, but uh, it's cold here. It's safe. I like it. I like to look out here and I like to see the snow. I like to see the cold. I like to snowshoe. I haven't ever tried cross-country skiing yet, but there's a whole lot of things to do up in a place like this. And every year I'm here, I get more and more used to this winter. I love it. You know, hid inside for a while, you know, the first, when we first came up here many years ago. And I just kind of thought, well, you know, just do my work and things for the ministry and I won't go outside much. And now this is my favorite time of the year. I love the winter. The, the hard things that you think, oh, how would I get by with this and whatever else off grid? You start to learn to love them when you understand the ancient, ancient ways, the ancestral ways. You start to see the, the ancient people didn't, didn't hide from nature. They went out and embraced it. They didn't want a, a huge living room with a huge big screen TV that they could sit there and watch somebody else entertain them. They go out there. And this is your entertainment. You see, the reason a lot of people go out into the off-grid type of thing and they fail is because they don't have the right mindset. They don't think about it the right way. And so as a result, they come out and they have other expectations and they fail at that. And then they just say, okay, I can't live like this anymore. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. They don't want to learn from older people in the area either. That's another thing that you need to think about. Get to know your neighbors. Get to know people. Get to know older people in the area. I've learned a lot about northern Maine from northern Mainers, people that were born and raised here. I love to talk to them. The older, the better. Um, I like to go to historical things, museums and whatever I can in the area. How did the people do this? How did they do that? I mean, this, this area up here, northern Maine, especially up in the county, um, they weren't even plowing the roads until I think the 1960s or so. <laughs> think about that. No plowed roads. Oh, I, I'd like to go down to Florida or so. Well, then you better leave before it starts to snow because otherwise you're here for five to six months until things start to thaw out. That's fascinating to me. I don't look at that and say, well, they sure were primitive. No, they sure were advanced. It's an amazing thing. And again, I don't care. Somebody has a truck, they have a plow. I have a plow truck, whatever. We can use some of the modern stuff that goes on and conveniences and things. Yeah, sure. Sure, I don't care. I'm not going to condemn you if you have solar power. I have solar power, you know, for some lighting. A um, little bit of refrigeration come summertime. But 
I'm not ever going to build some kind of a thing on this place here that's just the same as an on-grid house or something. I'm just not interested in that. And if you really want to be an off-gridder, you have to get into that mindset, you know, and read this ancient book here and look at the wisdom and say, you know what, if this book is God's book and this is what he wants for me to sleep in the woods and to be out here in the wilderness, huh, maybe I should take this book more serious. You know, a lot of people have a prejudice towards this book because this book is rough on sin and unfortunately because this book has been used by false organized religion out there to oppress people. But yet, if you actually would pick up this book, get by your prejudices and pick it up and actually read it for yourself, you'll see that the uh, message contained therein is actually very foreign and is contrary to what organized religion puts out. And I go off on a big rant there, but I'm not going to. We'll cover one more scripture and then we're done. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You say, well, Brian, this has been my dream for years and years, but I just try to bring it up. Every time I try to bring it up with my wife, she gets angry at me. She screams and yells at me and just throws a tantrum like a little, you know, child. She doesn't want anything to do with the off-grid life, brother, and I don't know what to do because I just don't think I can handle this city living much more and in town and I'm drowning in debt and, you know, I'm, you know, it's not just you saying that the off-grid or the, excuse me, the economy is going down. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing the problems. I'm seeing the 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 issues that are coming with this country. I'm seeing the the violence building and the people are getting angrier all the time and I can just feel this like there's going to be a civil war in this country. I'm getting a little scared. And I, I have a cabin in the mountains and I've always wanted to go there and live there full time, but my wife she's just she we she just plainly said, No, I will not do that. I will never move there. And what does the Bible say? Well, back in the book of Proverbs, chapter 21, verse 19, it says it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with an angry woman, angry and contentious woman. You say, well, then you're saying I should leave my wife? Well, let's see what the New Testament has to say. And bear with me, okay? Don't jump to conclusions. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. You might be saved man, and, and you have a lost wife, and she is pleased to be with you, and whatever, then don't divorce her. That's what it's saying there. Verse 13, And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Okay? If you're getting along and if, if everything's okay, then don't leave them. Don't get a divorce. Okay? That's fine. Verse 15, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? The New Testament does give grounds for divorce. Absolutely. If you are married to a lost person, if you're saved and you're married to somebody that's lost, and they're not pleased to dwell with you. They don't want anything to do with coming out to a place like this. They can't see the danger that lies ahead for this country. The danger of being on grid. I mean, Texas, just this year, massive power outages. Um, didn't even know it up here. We didn't feel anything. You say, well, yeah, it's just Texas, just local. What if it becomes national? They're talking about Operation Dark Winter. You can look into that military operations for if the power goes down. <laughs> what are you going to do? You say, well, okay, maybe if everything just goes, goes on, I'm not, I don't get into this doom and gloom conspiracy stuff. Okay, fine. What about civil unrest that we've already seen in this country? People that have lost everything that were living in the city, had their businesses burned down by a bunch of people be, 
Black Lives Matter, Antifa, whatever other satanic organizations. What about that? You know, um, you say, have you ever uh, advised a brother or sister to divorce their husband or wife? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. I've gone through some of the agony with some of the brethren where they tell me they're crying and they're saying, brother, I'm trying everything I can to keep my marriage together. I don't want to divorce. I don't want to go through that. We have children. I don't want them to go through this. But I have a wife that's lost. I have a husband that's lost. What am I supposed to do? If you're not pleased to dwell together and you want to get out to a place like this, you want to get out here where there's peace, ask for the old paths, and ye shall find rest for your souls. You want to get out here if you're a man and you have a cabin someplace, some land and it's a beautiful place, that's where you find your peace at and you have a wife that's contentious and angry and she will not change her mind, leave her. According to the scriptures. Well, the Bible says till death do us part. Uh, no, that's a marriage vow. Okay, there, nobody said any marriage vows in the entire Bible. Again, get your traditions and your teachings of men separated from what the scriptures actually teach. Nobody said, till death do us part. That is a vow that is said. And then that whole thing there. Again, it's a Roman Catholic thing. All right? Get that thing figured out. All right? God's called you to live in peace, brother, sister. And mostly brethren that I'm talking to right now. If you have a wife that's some high-maintenance city woman and she's lost and she wants nothing to do with you going out there and living out in nature, leave her. Plain and simple. If you have children especially that you need to think about, and uh, they'd rather be out with you out there and whatever, well, you might have a problem with the courts and things. I realize it's a satanic court system that we have in this country, but um, you would do well to get away and to come out to a place like this for safety and for sanity. <laughs> That's another thing. Um, if you're content living on the grid, again, I don't, I don't care. People want to live on the grid. I'm not, I'm not looking down on you or whatever else. People want to do that. That's fine. I understand. But uh, there's, a, there's a very special thing about being off-grid. There's a very special thing about doing things for yourself and being self-sufficient. Um, it's a real blessing. It's a lot of hard work, but uh, the rewards are just out of this world. They really are. So... That's going to be it for this study. Hope it's been a challenge to you. Um, you know, you have one life to live. Don't waste it. I'll say that one more time. You have one life to live. Don't waste it. If you're a man and you want to live out in a place like this, make it happen. Okay? If you're a young man and you're single, um, you do well to look for a wife that is interested in nature. If you meet a girl and she just has to be taken to the finest restaurants and she doesn't like your car or your truck or whatever because it's just not new enough and she just has to be just perfect and she, you know, run away from her. Oh, but brother Brian, she's really good looking. I don't care. She'll make your life miserable. There are a lot of men out there that can testify to the fact that they uh, fell in lust with a woman, maybe even fell in love with her. Excuse my sarcasm. <laughs> But uh, it's hard for me. It comes out so naturally. Uh, <laughs> but they fall in love with some girl. She's beautiful. They think, wow, I can't believe she's giving me the time of day. I think this is going to be great to be married to her. They're married for a while. And she makes this guy's life miserable. She's never content with anything. She's a high-maintenance woman. And they just look for happiness all the time. Let's go to this vacation. Let's buy me this new car. Buy me this new fur coat. Well, some of them. You know take me out to this place to eat. I want to go to the opera. I want to go to the theater. I want this. I want this. I want that. And if you're one of those types of women, let the word of God rebuke you. You look at this book and you say, wow, women that are at ease, careless women. I think I qualify for that. You know, maybe our family would be better off if I let my husband have his wish of living out in a place like this. Maybe I'd be better off walking through the woods. Maybe our children would be better off growing up away from the city. 
so I don't have to worry about them all the time out there in the bad neighborhood and getting in with the wrong crowd and whatever else. Maybe we should come out to the nature, a natural area and whatever else. God, help me to be tough. Help me to be able to, to see the beauty out there in a wildflower rather than bought flowers from a florist someplace. My husband has to buy me a dozen roses. How about a dozen wildflowers that your children pick for you? And bring and say, here you go, Mom, I love you. How's that for a blessing? Hey, Mommy, I, bought you, I brought you some of these wild berries I picked out here. I found some raspberries. They're, they're blooming, Mom. You have to come and see. Come on, Mom, you have to look. The wild strawberries are growing right now. It's a blessing. But you'll never get to see it if you're just on grid, looking at the things of man. You'll never see those things. Unless you live out in the country and you can, you know, enjoy some of it. So, kind of an interesting study here, but uh, one that I've been, it's been on my mind for a while. Um, and, and I just, I want to say one other thing to the young people out there because there's a lot of young people that watch this ministry and uh, you come to me for advice and I appreciate that. Uh, I can give you a lot of good sound advice and and both pro and con, you know, don't do what I did, in other words, some in some ways, but um, watch out for the bushcraft thing. Watch out, watch out for the bug out bag and the, and the uh, survival uh, when Teotwaki happens and stuff hits the fan and all this other stuff. Here's what you do. Um, how many of those channels that do this bushcraft survivalism type of stuff, seven day wilderness trip, how many of them fled the city when the cities were locked down? I don't think any of them. Well, you know, they're going to they're going to run out in the wilderness. They're going they can make it out here, okay? Uh, they can make a, a campfire with uh, sticks rubbing together and whatever else. Well, I have a wood stove right over here. I can go and get warm. You know, um, bushcraft is okay, but. I just, I always find it kind of a little bit goofy, you know, actually. You can, you know, get in your vehicle and drive to some place and even fly into some place or whatever, and you can survive for a week. And then they get right back to the city again. But don't worry, because when things fall apart, they're going out there, they're going to survive when everybody else is dying. No, they won't. Uh, if you're a young person and you have some kind of a backpack with all kinds of survival goodies and uh, you know, a, a tent and a water purification tablets and a and a, a knife that's this long or something like that and and whatever that you can whack trees down and make a survival shelter and you got your paracord and you got I've studied all this stuff, you know, and and you have all these things that you can survive. You're not going to. Okay, it makes no sense. If you're really about survival up here, then you'd already realize the danger of where you live and you'd leave. All right. And you say, well, how do I get started as a young man? Well, uh, get a vehicle that you can pay for. Okay, a vehicle that's paid off. You have to work hard. Work at a, a job and whatever else. I did for many years. Worked at a toxic factory and, and whatever. I actually lost my appendix as a result of it. All the toxicity I breathed in and, and things. Bad situation. You can watch my videos. What I, you know, what, what Brian Denlinger did for a living, I think is what it's called. Share my testimony and my working life um, but you get a get a good vehicle um, maybe even some kind of a, a camper or something like that or buy an old ambulance or buy a van or something look at the people who live out of their vans live out of their vehicles uh, do that okay get become independent start traveling to nature areas see what kind of area would best suit you look at your ancestry uh, if you're a northern European move north by all means if you're of African descent or something like that, well, go with your ancestral things. Study what people did in Africa. You know, it's a, there's a great a lot of culture over there. People live very sustainably. Even today, a lot of the people in Africa don't live with electricity. They live out in the plains and out in the everything else with a lot of dangerous animals around. There's some good wisdom over there. Oriental, learn those things. Native American, whatever. You know, learn what your ancestors have done and start out basic and then build up. You can do that, but 
don't fall into the, the trap of thinking that somehow you're part of the off-grid mindset or the, the bushcraft mindset because you watch the videos on YouTube. Uh, that doesn't do it. Um, you should be inspired enough to say, hey, I'm going to come to a northern area or I'm going to go out into the woods and I'm going to try this and I'm going to try that. You have to get started doing it because if you just sit there and, and become a passive partaker, uh, you'll never amount to anything. Just being very plain with you. And uh, if you're a woman and, and you say, you know what, I'm really convicted right now. I would like to live a, a more natural life and whatever and move out to an area and things. Talk it over with your husband. Start to say, you know what, I think I could live a little bit tougher than what I'm living. And start putting it into practice. Use less water. Um, get a sawdust toilet. Five-gallon bucket with a toilet lid on it and you get sawdust and you go to the bathroom in there. You know, start to do some, implement some things that will work for you off grid. Find ways that you can cut back on refrigeration. Um, there's so many things that you can learn and it's, it's a very rich, fulfilling life. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to live. So uh, experiment with some solar power. Just buy some small solar type of stuff and set it up and whatever and charge your lights and, and things. And, you know, and some advice I'd like to give, um, and that is if you do decide to move to a northern environment, do not move in winter, okay? If you want to be off grid, don't ever do that, okay? Do what the ancient people did. Come in the early spring and then prepare for winter, okay? You don't come in the winter and say, we're here, let's make it happen. That doesn't work. Never has, never will, unless you're moving on grid, all right? There's a bunch of, of things I could share with this whole thing. I was actually going to do a whole seminar uh, on the off-grid issue, and I just, you know, it's, it's going to take me probably a, a month or two to get everything done with all the editing and everything, all the other work I did, and I thought, well, I have other things that are more pressing and more important right now, but um, certainly if, if, if somebody's interested, you can contact me and, and whatever, write us through the post office or, you know, or just write in the comments and say, hey, you know, could I have some questions? Could you this? Could you talk about this or that in other videos? Well, maybe I'll do that. Um, but there's a whole, uh, a whole, I don't know what you'd even call it, a whole source of wisdom out there, ancient wisdom, ancient cultures and things um, that you can learn from and really make this life out here enjoyable. Um, so... That's going to be it. I do thank you for your time, those of you who have watched, and I do pray that um, you would think about this. And um, if the Lord is leading you to live a more sustainable life, more off-grid, an easier life, in terms of uh, easier for your health and whatever else, it's, it's harder, it's much harder, um, but it's so much more rewarding. If you're a woman and you're convicted by this and you're saying, you know what, I'm keeping my husband from being off-grid, you know, if you're a man and you have a wife that's lost and she's saying, I don't want anything to do with this and, and I'll never change, follow the Bible, follow the New Testament. It says, leave her. You're not under bondage in such cases. So that will be it. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.